Vítajte pri počúvaní podcastu Ines. Všetky naše ďalšie podcasty si môžete vypočuť na stránke ines.sk lomitko audio. Prajeme vám príjemné počúvanie. Dnešná epizóda je rozhovor s Martinom Ogerupom, riaditeľom dánskeho think tanku Cepos na tému Welfare State a prekažky na trhu práce. Martin Ogerup vystúpil na medzinárodnej konferencii o konkurencie schopnosti, ktorú v novembri 2015 organizoval Ines. It's my pleasure to have a chance to talk to Mr. Martin Ogerup, who is the president of Center for Political Studies and Independent Think Tank uh, based in uh, Copenhagen, Denmark, uh, who uh, was a member of experts panel at the conference on competitiveness uh, in Bratislava, November 2015. Uh, Mr. Agarup, uh, everybody in Slovakia talks about the uh, success of the social welfare model of Scandinavian countries. Uh, could you please tell us some more uh, details on uh, whether this should be considered as a result of the welfare system or the wealth of Denmark uh, was created maybe earlier or uh, has different roots? Yes, well, um, the Scandinavian economies and, and countries are quite well functioning. We have a high level of trust. We have... Uh, uh, you know, uh, very few uh, uh, people living uh, in poverty, um, uh, we have a high wealth. So uh, we, we're quite, quite successful, but that success goes back uh, before the welfare state was created. If you look at uh, the total tax burden, for instance, um, Denmark had a low tax burden in international comparison, um, around the same level as what the tax level was in the US at the time, up until the sort of mid 60s, when we started having a significantly higher tax rate. So the welfare state is historically a relatively new thing. Uh, but if you look at uh, Denmark's uh, track record at, at wealth creation, Denmark was wealthy a long time before that, obviously poorer than we are now, but richer than most countries at the time, which shows that Denmark was very uh, efficient in getting close to the produc- uh, production frontier, what, what was the kind of wealth that was uh, possible to create at the time, given the level of technology. So from 1900 until the 1930s, uh, we increased our relative wealth and became wealthier than most countries. And we peaked around uh, 1930 to 1950. And since then, we have uh, decreased slightly in relative wealth. But the main point here is that we were wealthy long before the welfare state. And we had a well-functioning economy before that. And that's because we have had a open market economy, uh, a capitalist system uh, f- for uh, a very long time in, in Denmark. Uh, so we have a very well-functioning private sector with uh, low level of uh, regulation, uh, relatively speaking. uh, All Western countries have regulation. We also have bad regulation in Denmark, but relatively speaking, we're doing okay. We have a flexible uh, labor market with very little uh, regulation. It's easy to hire and fire people. Uh, We don't have the state owning a lot of uh, uh, production uh, companies, uh, that most of it is private, you know, with very few exceptions. Um, so that's the basis of uh, the uh, relative economic success of, uh, of, of Denmark. Then we have a big public sector with a lot of transfer payments and very high taxes and uh, a big state monopoly sector that is, uh, uh, w- parts of it is not very efficient. Uh, but we can manage that because the rest uh, is is in order. You can sort of compare it to, uh, you know, if you uh, uh, do a lot of exercising and uh, uh, normally eat uh, healthily, then if you if you eat uh, one big chocolate cake a day, you can still be be slim. 
But it's not because you're eating the chocolate cake you're slim. You're slim because you're doing all the other things. It's a bit the same with the Danish economy. So uh, the wealth and economic growth of Denmark uh, happens uh, despite of a huge welfare state. But uh, Denmark was facing uh, huge problems maybe 30 years ago. Uh, what was following uh, these uh, economic problems? Yes, um, that there, in the um, late 70s, uh, early 80s, there was a, a big economic crisis in Denmark and the social democratic government basically gave up uh, and uh, uh, a new prime minister who was a conservative uh, came into office and uh, started uh, a reform process that has been carried on really until this day. There has been sort of a reform momentum building up where we have uh, fairly rapid reforms uh, every few years uh, of all kinds of things. The labor market has been reformed. We've lowered the unemployment benefit period uh, over several times. We've lowered marginal tax rates. We have uh, privatized uh, the public companies that we did have in the, in the 80s. Uh, only have a few left now. Uh, we have uh, lowered corporate tax rates. We have uh, um, made labor markets much more flexible in all kinds of ways and um, had, um, for instance, a welfare reform that has uh, indexed the retirement age uh, so that as people live longer, we automatically increase retirement age so that we don't get into a demographic uh, uh, um, burden uh, with uh, uh, public finance. So all these things have been going on as, and m most of it has been moving Denmark in a more sort of uh, market-oriented direction. Uh, and that process is still going on, but as there's still more needing to be done. And I don't want it to sound like we are sort of home and safe. There are all kinds of problems in the Danish economy, but broadly speaking, it's been doing okay, and that's because of all these reforms. So it's very misleading to talk about a Danish model Denmark now looks completely different from Denmark in 1985 or 1995 and we keep changing the way the system works because we need to do that as a small open economy. Mm -hmm. uh, what is often admired uh, about Denmark is especially labor market and its uh, flexibility. Uh, could you tell us uh, a little bit more about the efficiency uh, of the labor market in terms of uh, new jobs and similar issues? Yes. Um, there are problems in Denmark uh, with the way the system works, but you know I think you'd find it more interesting to to hear the, the stuff that's good. So I'll, I'll concentrate on that, but you know let the listeners know that that uh, Denmark is not some kind of uh, paradise. Uh, there are problems there too. But some of the good things about the Danish labor market uh, is that um, uh, it is very uh, uh, flexible in the sense that if you hire someone and you find out that you the market situation changes, you don't need that person anymore, or you find out that the person doesn't have the skills you thought the person had. You can very easily um, uh, lay off that worker again. And now that may sound like a, a bad deal for workers, but in fact, uh, a few years back there was a, a survey looking at how secure people felt in employment in Sweden, but they don't have that system, they have a protection of, of workers, you can't just fire them, uh, and comparing Sweden to Denmark. And it turned out the Danes felt more secure than, than the Swedes. Why is that? Well, the thing is, if you get f fired, if you lose your job in Denmark, it is very easy to find a new job for most people, not everyone, but for most people, it's easy to find a new job because the labor market is very efficient. Uh, employers don't face a huge risk when they hire people because they can always, if they make a bad decision, they can, they can change it again. Uh, and therefore, uh, we have a big churn, uh, we have a big, uh, um, a very large proportion of, of the labor force change job every year. About, we have about at least 500,000 job openings um, every year, it's about 20% of, of jobs, so 20% so change job every year. Uh, and that also means from an economic perspective that it's uh, quite easy for people to move on if they if they sit in a job where they have acquired skills that are uh, would make it they would be 
uh, able to get a, a better job that's better paid somewhere else where their skills are applied in a more efficient way, they can do that. And there's no risk involved in doing it. If they can find the employer, they can take that other job. And that means that uh, you can uh, utilize the human capital much better uh, than you would in a less flexible labor market. Also, stuff like um, uh, working hours and, you know, all, all the, the, the contracts between employees, between unions and employers are very flexible and often negotiated on a, a you know, individual company basis even. So that uh, you know, one company has certain needs uh, and they can negotiate uh, terms with their workforce. For instance, some companies have a lot of uh, work that is uh, seasonally, you know, depending on the season. And they can negotiate uh, with their workers that they don't get overtime pay. Instead, they work less other times of, mm -hmm. of the year. And if you don't like that as a worker, you can go work somewhere else. But if you like it, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's good. Uh, and uh, everyone is, uh, is is happy. So, so that's also an example of how you can uh, you can um, use the the labor more force in a more efficient way. So there is uh, nothing like legally based severance pay. So if you are firing someone, the employer. Uh, has to pay one, two, or three wages to the person that was fired. Well, yes, it, uh, you know, depending on how long you've been in the job. If you if you've been in a job for uh, a large number of years, you get up to six months. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the maximum. Most mm -hmm. people, you know, if you've worked for for for, for less than than a, than uh, than a year, it's uh, it's it's one month, and then, then it gradually increases mm -hmm. over time. Uh, but also, you don't have to have any special reason. I mean, you can just say, "Look, um, we don't fit well together," uh, which I think is, you know, a very good reason. It's very important to to work with with people you uh, you are you 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 you, you, you fit together with. Mm -hmm. So the discussion in Europe uh, uh, these days uh, uh, is very focused on the problem of uh, immigration yes. and. Uh, their potential uh, and ability to find a job on the job market. So, uh, how is Denmark uh, uh, doing in employing them, and what are the uh, barriers uh, the immigrants face there? But now we're approaching some of the less rosy sides of the Danish uh, labor market, uh, which has to do with the way the welfare state works. Uh, we have uh, we have a very poor track record in getting uh, immigrants into employment. It is, uh, you know, a big problem and uh, it is not only an economic problem because uh, it is expensive to have uh, taxpayers finance people not working. It is also a social problem because a big part of becoming part of a new society that you move to is to, to get a job. And uh, most people learn the language. I think most people, certainly a lot of people learn the language a lot better. Uh, in a job, in a real life situation, than sitting in some school with a lot of other people who don't speak the language very, very well, which is uh, the situation right now. Uh, so that's a big problem. Uh, and the reason why we have that problem is that there are several, but one of them is uh, that we have very high transfer payments in Denmark, very generous uh, uh, pay to, to people who are unemployed. Uh, and uh, to pe even to people who don't have an unemployment insurance, we have uh, transfer payments that are very generous in, in an international uh, comparison. And that all sounds very nice, but it means that this puts a floor on the, the minimum wage. So we, we don't have a, le a, a, a law, uh, by, uh, by law, uh, a, a defined minimum wage, but we have a de facto minimum wage, which is uh, part of what's negotiated between employees and employers. And that's at a very, very high level in Denmark. Um, which is nice for the for the people who are in employment, but it's not very nice for the people who are not in employment because you can compare it to a ladder that's that's missing the the, the lower few steps on the ladder. So uh, some people can't get onto the ladder and can't um, move into a career situation where they get human skills, human capital through working through experience. Uh, and that's that's a big problem that needs to be addressed in Denmark because we see a lot of immigrants coming into the country now. 
So in Slovakia, we have discussions about minimum wage uh, every autumn uh, when the government or uh, unions are trying to uh, usually increase it. Uh, so we have a legal, a legally set minimum wage. You said that y you have sort of, uh, uh, not informal, but uh, minimum wage that is uh, a result of uh, real negotiations of unions and employers. Uh, so what are the tools uh, to how to change this situation when it's not, it's not set by a law? Yes, it's, it's complicated. Uh, and, and even saying that it's a minimum wage is a, a little bit of a simplification because uh, there is, uh, if you decided to go to Denmark and set up a business, you could do that. And if you're not a member of an employer's association, you can offer any wage you want to. But unions can then decide to uh, blockade your business. Okay, so it's, it's kind of a complicated situation. They can also decide not to blockade your business. So we do have people working for very, very low wages in Denmark. But it's, uh, it's sort of, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's a sort of gray area. Now, um, for that to expand so that we can, we can get more people into employment, we basically need the unions and the employers to sit down with the government and decide uh, that uh, we need a combination of uh, several things. Uh, one is a, a new agreement between the unions and the employers that they will accept a lower wage for, a, uh, you know, for maybe a three years, maybe maybe longer. That is uh, significantly below what is the current minimum wage because we have this uh, problem that we cannot integrate immigrants into the labor market. Uh, but we also need the government to uh, to. Uh, uh, to reform some of the transfer payments that we pay because it is not really conceivable to have uh, wages that are below transfer payments. So it's a combination of, uh, of, of different things that need to happen at the same time. And that's always tricky uh, when you reform things. It's easier to have one reformer that makes a decision than having to have several that need to get to an agreement. But there's a lot of pressure now because the problem is real and needs to be uh, addressed. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Egerup. Uh, thanks for your time and thanks for your answers. It was my pleasure.